Hi, I'm Alan Giles, an emergency physician. Thanks for watching this Zoom PowerPoint presentation. It's on who should become an emergency physician and when you do, how to not only survive but to thrive. So I'll just share the PowerPoint presentation. A few seconds. So the question is, what sort of junior doctor should consider emergency medicine as a career? Okay, it's a good one. The, when you think about it, to some degree, there is a reputation that this is the sort of emergency physician. You know, a bit of a cowboy, does things their own way, breaks all the rules, gets there in the end, bit of a maverick. The reality is that probably couldn't be further from the truth. What do you need to be to be a good emergency doctor and a good emergency physician? I think you need these things. You need to be an ER doc, that is. You need to be energetic. So the reality is all through your career, you're gonna be running around, especially on your clinical shifts. You won't be doing Sudoku. You'll have brief lunch breaks most likely. And if you don't have the energy to do that, or you don't feel like that's gonna be what most of your career is gonna be like, you shouldn't be doing it. Mind you, if you do have that sort of excitement and energy, maybe this is the way to go. The next is as a risk assessor. Now, every time we see a patient as a doctor in the emergency department or review a patient, we're checking out the risk. We're trying to decide have I got the right diagnosis? Am I missing a more severe diagnosis? Um, am I able to send them home? Is this investigation warranted? This is all risk assessing. The better you are at being a risk assessor, the better you are will be as an ER doc. Next is dedication. I know this is the same for all um, specialties, but it's certainly there for emergency um, medicine because if you're not dedicated you won't get through the primary exam go through all the training and get through the fellowship exam and if you do stumble through that you have to be dedicated to do the ongoing in and outside hours that are required in emergency medicine the o you have to be optimistic i think that emergency medicine lends itself to people who are sort of glass half full uh, because there are a lot of hurdles. There are a lot of positives, but there are a lot of hurdles, whether it's the patients themselves or the interrelationships you have um, with um, the inpatient teams or administration. All those things, having a glass half full view of it makes it more not only tolerable, but you can work with them and quite enjoy it. If you're a pessimist, I'd say go for something with less patient contact. Being a good communicator, of course, this is, a, is vital in, in most parts of medicine. However, unlike most other parts of medicine, you're spending your entire time with teams. You're in a team with the nurses and the porters and everyone else in the ED. You're then talking to inpatient teams. You're linking to outpatient groups. All these things, the better you are at communicating, the better you'll be able to relate to your patients the better histories you'll get, the better examinations you'll be able to do, and the better doctor you'll be. If you're not a good communicator, emergency medicine certainly isn't for you. One thing about it though, it's got a quite a flat hierarchy. I like emergency medicine for that reason. It doesn't have some of the traditional hierarchy sometimes you see in, I don't know, parts of other parts of medicine, physician training, etc. Even those are flattening, but um, Emergency medicine has always been a broad church with a flat hierarchy, and, and that can be good. Now, I've used Jungle Book 1967, the cartoon, to illustrate, and this is somewhat biased and somewhat caricatured, but where emergency medicine sits inside the hospital hierarchy. So take this with a grain of salt, but it does have a little bit of truth to it too. I think in many ways, emergency medicine generally, and you inside it, is mugly. So you are the center of the story because you're the front of the hospital. 
you're often the one that goes to the media for positive and for negative. Um, and a lot of things spins around you. However, the rest of the hospital somewhat perceives you as still being juvenile and junior in their whole system. Let's move it through to the head of medicine or the division of medicine. Historically, they've had a lot of power inside the hospitals and they still do, especially in the traditional larger hospitals. Uh, they seem to be the uh, perceive themselves the people who have the, the academic knowledge of medicine. And in many ways, that's true. Palliative care, increasing role um, in emergency medicine, because of course, with older people, then presenting to emergency medicine, to your emergency department, you're going to be linking into palliative care and having to know more about it in the next 30 years, more than I did through my career. Next administration, Car the Snake. I know it sounds a little bit a caricaturist, but they're sort of between clinicians and politics. They have slightly different approach because they have different drivers than you do. Um, so work with them, but always be careful of the hypnotism of their eyes. Surgeons, well, surgeon, it has to be sheer car, doesn't it? That sort of elegant, um, perceive themselves that way. But in many ways, they fit nicely with emergency medicine because they tend to see the world in surgical, non-surgical. Cut it out, put it in the bucket, leave it there. Um, and you'll find some of your best relationships will probably be inside the surgical field. Anesthetists, no Baloo the bear. They have got time for their Sudoku, uh, but they're the people that uh, are often your, one of your closest allies. They're the ones that know more about the physiology, they know more about their equipment than you probably do, um, and can be a real ally when you are in a squeeze, especially with airways. So keep a good relationship off with your anaesthetist. Nursing in charge, um, well, they've seen everything. They've over the years, and they're the person that when you squeeze, you're going to be turning to, and you'll be reflecting and bouncing off every day. The better you have a relationship with your nursing staff generally and with the nursing in charge, the better off you'll be. Pediatrics couldn't resist it because it'll break your heart some of the things you'll see inside pediatrics, but it also will warm your heart more than just about anything else. A strong pediatric team in the rest of the hospital will make your job a hell of a lot easier. Ambulance paramedics, they look at the world from the outside. They sort of have a different view of the place because they're not employed by the hospital and uh, they can give you the true story about what happened to the patient before they got there. And they can sort of reflect on uh, the hospital and the emergency department a little bit um, off center. So I think they're very worthwhile having a chat with. And finally, a place this has been the deflectors. Deflectors are a whole group of things, like as you're going through your training, uh, that relationships and the desire perhaps to get more money and do um, locum shifts, all these deflectors need to keep under control or else you won't get through your fellowship. Okay. And remember, a couple of things. If you decide to go through emergency medicine, you will always work hard. It is not an easy road and you'll be working hard clinically. Expect that every clinical shift. You are a specialist in acute medicine. You are an acutist. This is the thing that sets you apart from everyone else. You are the acutist. For other things in that subacute to chronic area, you will be the most, um, at best the equivalent of a senior registrar whether that be orthopedics, intensive care, neurology, that is where you'll fall or in pediatrics. Because let's face it, they spend their entire time doing their subspecialty. But what you are is that you're the person I want to see as the team leader when I come in under a motor vehicle accident, have a cardiac arrest, need resuscitation, or have a really sick kid. And that's what you'll become if you decide to do emergency medicine. If you want to be that person, you will learn to become that person. To get there, however, it is a long and winding road. So just briefly, this is the sort of sequence that I think occurs. You come out of medical school, it's first a decision. 
Live mid school, you just want a paying job where you can pay off your hex debt and be part of a team. You get rotated down to ED and you find you can actually make some medical decisions, not be a clerk or just a human retractor. And then phase two is the early years, PGY two or so, you decide, yeah, I might do emergency medicine. Uh, you then get a job in ED as an SRMO um, and you find you work with people you like, who like you, which is really important long term. And then you have to sit the first of the exam. This takes about a year of work to study for it. Most pass first time, if not second time. The primary exam, it is difficult. Then you get through the post-primary years, the phase three. We are a registrar. You're rotating through, you're working at various EDs, intensive care, pediatrics, various optional things such as retrieval. Uh, and you can pick up some ultrasound as you go along. You finally, you fit the fellowship, sit the fellowship exam, which is a written exam and OSCEs. It's a hard exam, as all fellowship exams are. Then when you finally get spat out the other end, you either become a staff specialist or a VMO. Staff specialist position has the advantage in that you're part of the team. You have, if you're full-time, you have generally four 10-hour shifts in the week. One of them is a non-clinical where you look at auditing, research, all sorts of other things in teaching. Uh, you work once every four weekends uh, and you're on call of course for most of that. Uh, if you do a VMO, you're basically a gun for hire. You come in and you do a clinical shift. If you do VMO, you often be doing more evenings than you will days. So the good bits, well, you're paid well. You are paid well as a staff specialist or a VMO. And when it's good, it is fantastic. When you, everything goes well um, you, and you're working really well as an acute generalist, then it's fantastic. Now the bad bits, patient flow, it's improved over the last 15 years, but getting space and getting people out into the out of your ED, um, causing problems with arguments with inpatient teams is an ongoing problem. The ugly bit, well, probably because of the bad parts, there is a high burnout rate. In fact, of all the specialties, emergency medicine was often quoted both Australia and UK and US as having the highest burnout rate. So you've got to be aware of that from the beginning, very beginning, and make sure that you look after yourself. So how do you make sure you don't burn out? Well, part of this, and um, I'll just there's a few things you can do to survive ED. How you can out care, outwit, outthink, and outlast. So this is what is great. Look, it's great, you know, you're making these exciting things, it's like you're doing ultrasound on something, yeah. Some of it's great, too much for too long, no control. Having no control of your existence is what gives you stress. So how do you avoid this? You mix and you dilute longer term. What are your mixes? Well, retrieval. Retrieval's great. Retrieval, you get to work with a team, with, um, with you get to work outside, it's a small team. You generally only have one or two patients at a time. You control that. Uh, you get to be fit. You get to jump in a helicopter. And, uh, and it's something you can do as part of your existence for almost your entire career. Intensive care, if you're that way inclined, intensive care can be great as part of what you do. Remember, you're gonna to have to do more study to do intensive care, but if it fits your idea of things are a bit slower and a bit more academic, um, then intensive care may be an option for you. Education, doing ultrasound. Um, I think everyone likes to teach, and for the right person, being doing education um, is magnificent and certainly um, can keep your interest and your academic interest inside it and that goes along with research if you're someone who's driven down research you find that as a way to dilute some of the clinical effects long term in the burnout i place this photo at the bottom here um, it's from APLS in um, in Cambodia it reminds me that that if you are able to work overseas, whether you're giving a course or you're um, actually staying over there and working as a volunteer for a length of time, 
it will certainly um, inspire you and recharge your batteries and you'll be able to give back to a certain degree. I mean, you'll probably get much more out of it than they will, but you'll be able to give back to the places you're doing some of this work. And I think it's actually really important that um, emergency physicians think about doing that as part of their career. And if you're lucky, you'll get the hashtag win position. That is, you'll be doing what you love, you'll be good at what you're doing, and you'll be paid well for it, which is great if you're in a place like Sydney. And so emergency medicine for some people can fall into that area. But you've just got to make sure that you realize what you're getting into, what the advantages and disadvantages, as with every specialty, whether it's interventional radiology, whether it's cardiothoracic surgery, whether it's cardiology, whether it's emergency medicine, there are advantages and disadvantages in all of them, and you have to go in with your eyes absolutely open to make the most of it. Thanks. I hope you enjoy it.